Now, before we go into a deep dive in the mechanics of D3 and all the studies I'm about to show you, I want to actually touch upon the nocturnal question of like, does a nocturnal snake need UV? So let's break this down in a literal sense. So melatonin is the hormone that's produced to make us diurnal animals sleepy. But on the flip side, it makes a nocturnal animal energized. And when light hits our retina, it blocks the production of melatonin. And that's what makes us wake up. But in the flip side for nocturnal animals, when they experience that light, it makes them go to sleep. So the scenario is the same, that the cycle of like light blocking the production of melatonin is the same, but we both flipped and used the melatonin differently. It makes us sleepy and makes them energized. So light is still the cue in their day-night cycle that gets them to act appropriately based upon their behaviours. So actually the premise that you'll see, the old time, old school premise that you'll see floating around the hobby online is that nocturnal animals don't need access to light because they want to sit in dark, is actually quite an illogical premise. They still need the daily cycle to act to actually be nocturnal, otherwise if there's no light eliciting them to sleep during the day, then they aren't acting nocturnal, they're just sat in the dark. And hormonally they're going to be very very different than a nocturnal species that's given that day night cycle okay so we've gone over why a day night cycle was important to nocturnal animal hormonally and mentally but what about uvb specifically well many nocturnal species will actually cryptically bask in light so there are many geckos and many nocturnal snake species that have been documented actually sleeping out in the open on a tree branch, or maybe cryptically basking under, you know, maybe leaves, maybe a overhanging bush, where it's like dappled light coming through, and then there's small sections of light hitting their body. Or maybe even they are under something, but they stick out a single coil, and they cryptically bask under UV while sleeping that way. So even if they aren't particularly active during the day, they still utilise the resource of UV light in a cryptic manner. So by having UV available to a nocturnal species, not only is it contributing to the, the light eliciting the, the blocking of melatonin and their day-night cycle, but it also allows them to cryptically bask and access UVB for the processes we're about to go through. So hang with me because we're going to go into deep dive here and it's really, really interesting. So what happens when a reptile sits under uv well first of all before we even start talking about calcium or vitamin d or anything uv actually has a direct effect upon the skin of the snake it kills bacteria fungi and viruses so without even going into much more than that there's already a role happening just directly from the antimicrobial properties of uv on the skin already uvb also affects the skin cells and it plays a role in immune modulation so it stimulates the white blood cells and lymphocytes and melanocyte stimulation that's where tanning occurs skin cells also respond by secreting beta endorphins that are released into the bloodstream creating that feel good feeling in response to sunlight making basking pleasurable and desirable hence why us humans even like to sunbathe because of that feel good feeling it's those beta endorphins being released in response to the uv light when uvb hits the skin pro vitamin d is converted by skin cells into a chemical called pre vitamin d3 when the animal is warm this pre vitamin d3 is isomerized this means the atoms are rearranged in the molecule this happens slowly in warm animals, in warm skin, over several hours until the pre-vitamin D is converted into vitamin D3. So now we have vitamin D3 in the skin. And before it even goes into the bloodstream and goes into other effects, it's actually used locally within skin cells. Enzymes convert vitamin D3 into calcidiol or 25-hydroxyvitamin D. And then a second enzyme converts it into 1,2,5-hydroxyvitamin D, or calcitriol. Now this calcitriol is a hormone that is used within the skin cells to transcribe genes and to signal between the cells. This stimulates antimicrobial peptide synthesis, which are chemicals that prevent bacteria and viruses from getting into cells, and it also strengthens the skin cell wall to prevent invasion from pathogens. It modulates the immune response by stimulating the white blood cells within the skin. It also modulates skin cell division. Remember, a major component of cancer 
is the inhibition of cell division, where nothing is telling the process to stop. This is where growths occur. So basically in cancer, they have the inhibition to tell cell replication to stop. So things become compacted where they run out of space and then they layer up and then they just amass into this growth. And that's why we have tumors and growths in relation to cancer because the cells have lost their ability to tell themselves to stop. So all of this is only just happening within the skin. The vitamin D also moves into the bloodstream from the skin. And then when vitamin D is delivered to the liver, the liver converts it into calcidiol, which is that 25 hydroxy vitamin D3, and it releases it back into the bloodstream. The same happens with dietary vitamin D when the food is absorbed and the vitamin D is transferred from the gut into the bloodstream. And then it's converted into that calcidiol, that 25 hydroxy vitamin D3, in the same way that the vitamin D from cutaneous synthesis from sunlight occurs. Some of the calcidiol, or the 25 hydroxy vitamin D, is then converted in the kidney to calcitriol, which is 125 hydroxy vitamin D3. It's this 125 hydroxy vitamin D, or the calcitriol, alongside parathyroid hormone that controls the absorption of calcium from the gut. It enables calcium in the gut to be taken and laid down in the bone. It also keeps the levels of calcium up in the blood, for your muscles and growth. I mean, calcium is even needed for muscle fibers to even contract. This is how important vitamin D is to the process of calcium metabolism in the body. But it doesn't stop here. That's only the systemic effects and the calcium metabolism. There's also autocrine and paracrine functions. So what's that? So when the D3 in relation to calcium metabolism does not require huge amounts of vitamin D to maintain, what happens when you have more than what's needed to complete this process? The excess gets used for other purposes. Lots of organs have the ability to pick up the 25 hydroxy vitamin D3 into their cells from the bloodstream. So vitamin D also gets absorbed into many different organs and converted into 25 hydroxy vitamin D and then to the 125 hydroxy vitamin D3 within the cells in order to not interfere with the bloodstream process going on elsewhere with calcium metabolism. So after the liver converts the vitamin D to 25 hydroxy vitamin D or the calcidiol, that circulates in the bloodstream. And yes, it gets converted further in the systemic effects of calcium metabolism, but actually whilst it's being circulated in that bloodstream, a lot of the organs are taking that up into their cells and they're completing the cycle within their own cells when there's extra available to them. So within these organ cells, and they're going through the same cycle that's going on elsewhere, the same process is happening in these organ cells as it was in the skin cells, the gene transcription and intracellular signaling. Now this controls over 2000 genes. Now depending on what organ this is happening in, it does different things such as bolstering the immune system, regulating cell division and the prevention of potential cancer cells from establishing, but also neural development in growing embryos. There is a theory that failure to hatch could be due to the lack of vitamin D or lack of calcium because of the lack of vitamin D to metabolize it and not enabling the muscles to allow the snake to make that final push and work its way out of the egg or to twist in order to even get into the position to do so. When there's an injury, vitamin D also has an effect upon the repair of nerves and then vitamin D also affects fertility. It has an effect upon sperm counts, but most notably egg production because you need the calcium to be metabolized for the production of the shell and you need the D3 to go into the embryo for the embryo to be able to use the calcium. So what happens in insufficiency? I'm not talking the optimum and I'm not talking deficiency. What happens when we have enough to get by but we're not getting those extra effects from being the optimal? Well the autocrine and paracrine functions don't occur and what's there is used for the calcium metabolism alone. It's only used for those systemic effects. So the organism is surviving but the bonus effects of having optimal levels are removed. So the question becomes, are these snakes experiencing the optimum or are we only just achieving the systemic effects of calcium metabolism because we have potentially insufficient amounts? By the way, if you're finding this video really interesting, could you please leave a like on this video so that it may spread and help more keepers like you? So let's get into some snake studies. A paper was published in the American Veterinary Medical Association investigating if corn snakes had increased calcidiol concentrations with access to UV. Compared to a control group of corn snakes without access to UV, a rise in calcidiol would prove that corn snakes are using UV to increase vitamin D levels. 12 corn snakes were used in total, 6 were given UV and 6 were not. Blood was extracted and the levels of 25 hydroxyvitamin D3 or calcidiol was measured at the start and at the end of a 20 day period. 
At the end, the blood concentrations between the groups differed significantly. The UV test group had a mean concentration of 196 nmol per litre, and the control group had 57.17 nmol per litre. The test group rose from 63 nmol per litre on the day zero to 196 nmol per litre. That's a 211.11% increase. Let's look at another. So a similar paper was published in the Journal of Zoo and Wildlife Medicine, but this time they investigated Burmese pythons, and the time frame was 310 days. Now, this was only on four snakes, of which two had suitable data for day zero and 310, after two of the snakes experienced blood withdrawal inconsistencies, either on day zero or on day 310. So at the end of it, they only had two snakes to go by. On average, the two snakes had 39 nmol per litre on day 0 and 214 nmol per litre on day 310. That's a 525.6% increase. So how do reptiles actually stop the production of vitamin D? How do they not go into overdose? Well, cutaneous synthesis of vitamin D under UV is a self-limiting process. When the upper threshold of vitamin D is met, excess formed in the skin is recycled into inert byproducts. Basically, the break get put on and an overdose does not occur but when you approach this logically there's no way they're near the optimum if they can have like a 500 percent increase otherwise you would see like i would argue you would see you would see like a little topping off or maybe topping up on it but if they're already near the optimum you would see very little increase at all surely not like a 500 percent increase so are these snakes actually far below the optimal and they're just achieving systemic effects on the calcium metabolism. Okay, so let's look at a study where there wasn't a drastic increase. A similar study of the same type was performed on ball pythons. The study used 14 ball pythons, which had never experienced UV. The UV test group was composed of six females, and the no UV control group was composed of five males and three females. On day zero, the test group mean levels were 197 nmol per litre, and were 203 nmol per litre on day 70. On day 0, the control group was 77.7 nmol per litre, and on day 70 were 83 nmol per litre. All of the females across both groups had extremely high levels of 25 hydroxyvitamin D on day 0 compared to the control group. This makes them non-comparable from the start because they were already at really high levels. So the authors of the Burmese python paper actually discussed this bull python paper and they said, well, maybe it's because they were providing low levels of UV in which why they didn't actually increase much. But when I actually look at this paper, they're actually giving really high levels of UV. So I don't think this is the case. Now, the authors of the study did not evaluate the reproductive status of the snakes, but recognised that the study was performed between July and September, which is the season that some of the snakes had produced eggs before. So there's a possibility that egg production raises serum 25 hydroxyvitamin D levels, and that any vitamin D produced via UV could have been transferred into the developing eggs, which require high amounts of vitamin D for embryonic development. So you're not seeing this significant rise like you were in other papers because perhaps this was actually being put into the eggs within them so it's being taken out of their bloodstream and then we couldn't measure it now this could have been accounted for if they had just put some males in the test group but because they made it entirely female as in the uv test group obviously a male in there that isn't going through producing eggs would have controlled for that because it would have shown or oh, actually our males producing a huge amount so clearly there's something going on here with the females but because they didn't have a male in the test group we basically can't know so this is quite a notable methodology flaw now it could be entirely possible that ball pythons do not synthesize vitamin d from uv and obtain all their needs from their diet obviously very high levels of it to begin with in animals that have never experienced UV show that they are very good at using dietary vitamin D. It's also possible that the very high levels to begin with inhibited the creation of more D3 under UV because cutaneous synthesis of D3 under UV, like I said before, is a self-limiting process and they would put the brakes on. So when the upper threshold of vitamin D is met, excess formed in the skin is obviously recycled into those inert byproducts. This scenario, which I'm describing as a, as a possibility, if the snakes in the previous studies had this optimal level of vitamin D, this is what you would kind of expect to see as if there's this like very minimal change or maybe a slight top up, but no drastic increase. So the fact that there were 500% increases and 200% increases is suggesting there were very, very low 
compared to what the optimally should be. Also, like I mentioned before in the mechanics of the D3 cycle, pre-vitamin D needs heat in the skin to convert to actual vitamin D. Now, the authors noted that the ball pythons may have not been warm enough for this to occur. The pythons were provided with a temperature gradient of 20C to 30C, and measured cloacal temperatures were 27 degrees. The authors recognised that it's possible that higher temperatures than provided are needed for the conversion to occur. So basically, this study raises a lot of questions, but doesn't actually provide many answers. In a study on the eyes of ball pythons, they noted that ball pythons do have a visual cone that allows them to see within the UV spectrum. It's not totally clear what this is used for, maybe detecting UV reflective rodent urine to select for prime ambush positions, or even like the identification of other bull pythons. The same has been found in boa constrictors. So without access to UV, a bull python or a boa constrictor would be missing some of its ability to even see. Another study on bull python behavior found that bull pythons in captivity basked for 2.4 hours a day. It's also stated that in a preliminary study, they found that basking spots without UV were used significantly less than basking spots with UV. So bull pythons have the cones in their eye to see into the ultraviolet spectrum and in studies in captivity are shown to behaviorally seek out basking opportunities with UV. This further raises questions about the legitimacy of the blood work of the bull python paper. It isn't impossible that bull pythons do not cutaneously synthesize vitamin D3 through UV. But then what are they behaviorally basking for? Is it merely for the management of microorganisms on the skin? Is it for that feel-good factor of the beta endorphins being released? We don't truly know the answer. And actually, at any given time, their motivations might be different from before. Okay, so what about snakes that haven't been studied? Well, many snakes have never been studied in terms of the cutaneous synthesis of vitamin D through UV. It's a tongue twister. However, if like rep representatives of similar groups have, then it's logical to assume other members that are closely related can. So if like Burmese pythons, a member of the genus python can, it's probably likely that retics and you know, Angolan pythons and raw pythons probably can. And if corns can, it's very likely that like king snakes can, because again, the same scenario, king snakes and corn snakes can produce viable offspring. So they're close enough to do that. It's very likely they're close enough that they both also use UV. When you couple all of this that I've just told you with all the videos and pictures of different species that are untested basking under UV, you've got to question, what are they doing that for? And then you've got to question then, does it matter what they're doing it for? Or does it only matter that they're motivated to do it? If they are motivated to use a resource, clearly there is some use in that resource and therefore it's important to the animal because they see it as a useful resource. So do snakes need UV? Do they need it to survive? No. I think the many species being bred in captivity without access to it have shown that they will carry on and reproduce without it. But when always laid out before me, and I know everything that happens under the hood when it's provided, do I consider it a need for my snakes? Yes, because that's the baseline I've set for myself. My philosophy as a keeper, and let me know what you think of this, is I'm here to provide resources and options in a way that offers choices so that my snake can exercise agency and choose whether or not it uses a resource. And then they themselves can regulate when they want to use it and when they require it. The only individual that truly knows what is needed at what point and at what point in the day is the snake. We will never know that. So we should lay resources out before them and then give them the agency to manage their day across resources as they will. So whether they need it solely depends on how much you value the importance of the usefulness of giving UV to the snakes after I've laid out all the processes that occur. That entirely comes down to you. How much do you care that they have things beyond the need for the systemic effects of calcium metabolism and just going about their day to day and obviously reproduction as well? Animal welfare science only exists because people care to learn and study and adapt and grow because they want to give more than just needs. And if I don't care, then one could ask me why get into reptile care at all? If you like this type of science twist upon reptile care, then this is what this channel is all about. If you click the subscribe button, you'll get notified of when we upload videos in the future so that you can hang around and be part of the journey that we're all experiencing together.